Welcome to the new Investment Opportunities webinar series of the LPA. Today, we will look closely at investing in biotech. Our webinar will be cut in two parts. The first one will be with local practitioners shedding a light on the Luxembourg biotech scene. And afterwards, we will continue with different panelists on investment opportunities in this interesting asset class. As usual, you can ask your questions via the chat function or the Q&A button. Our session will be recorded and you will find it soon on our YouTube channel. So without further ado, let's start then with our local heroes of the biotech scene. And we will start then with Jean-Paul Scheuren, the administrator of the Luxembourg cluster and house of biohealth. And then we will continue with ITTM presented by Andreas Kremer and Tolerogenics by Marcus Ollert. Welcome gentlemen, and let's start. Hi, everybody. My name is Jean-Paul Scheuer. I am an, an Luxembourgish entrepreneur. I have been falling into the, uh, into the life science sector uh, in 2006 when I started uh, with the first uh, Luxembourgish uh, um, startup uh, for, of the University of Luxembourg. And uh, uh, in that sense, I was also invited to be the president in 2008 of the cluster biohealth from Luxembourg. And I had the, the, the opportunity to, to accompany the C sector, this young, very young cluster during its development phase. Uh, and what I will be discussing today a little bit more with you is uh, the, uh, how, how the sector is going on, how, what is happening in the sector. We, we have our, our, uh, today two guests, two young companies coming out of the sector, one less long, younger, the other very young company to present themselves. And I will present, uh, I will present the House of Biohealth, so this an incubator infrastructure. Uh, I am uh, the, one of the managers and the, the developer and initiator of this project. So let's go on in the detail of, in the, the, the project or the presentation of what is happening in the sector. I hope you see my screen. Uh, so you, when you look at the screen, this is the mapping of the sector. So we, the sector is uh, an, uh, a young, but very dynamic uh, uh, sector. We have uh, in Luxembourg now uh, 136 companies kind of, uh, being life science, uh, active in life science, uh, most of them being uh, in diagnostic and medical devices, but also more and more companies being in uh, digital, uh, digital health, uh, coming from digital health companies. This, uh, is, uh, this infographic comes from Lux Innovation, so if you are interested, you can have more deep uh, view into that. Uh, and uh, the sector, what we have been seeing is that the sector has been developing a lot. The state has been investing a lot in this sector. And we have also some success stories. And I think it's important also to know about success stories. So Fast Track Diagnostic was a Luxembourg company developed uh, in 2008 and was sold in 2017 to uh, Siemens Health in here, uh, becoming with, with that one of uh, the big actors in, uh, in uh, diagnostic tools. They are developing uh, PCR tests uh, and they also they developed the uh, Luxembourgish, uh, they developed the, the, the fast uh, diagnostic test for COVID in the beginning launch, in the beginning start of uh, phase of uh, COVID, so that we had been uh, uh, the possibility to launch this uh, large scale testing in Luxembourg. And that was very imp impressive from the, the uh, information guess uh, uh, sampling we could get out of that. Flan Health is another big company who is uh, who came to Luxembourg, who had his headquarters otherwise, and came to Luxembourg for making international business. Uh, it's a round tile healing uh, company, which is on the market with uh, Flamigel, but also with other products already. Uh, then Doctena is a well-known uh, European player in uh, in uh, in the health tech uh, sector. It's a digital company. Uh, it started with uh, first uh, issuance was uh, making appointments with doctors. Uh, now they are in Brussels uh, organizing the vaccinations uh, and are very active also in Germany and in other European countries. So this is some, uh, some of the important and, uh, 
private actors. Here we come to a very strong public, uh, strong uh, public research. With the Luxembourg Center for System Biomedicine was one of the biggest centers developed uh, in the, at the end of the, in uh, after the 2000 years, so 2006, 2007, 2010. Uh, we did we developed this with an American project. The American project in the meantime doesn't exist anymore, but the center exists and is uh, making really high level research. Same thing for Luxembourg Institute of Health, when we have uh, also an, an, a bunch of good uh, young and dynamic, but also not so young senior researchers doing a very good job. With the EBBL, the Integrated Biobank of Luxembourg, we have with these three institutes uh, and a very consistent approach to what we want to develop in Luxembourg. One of this was uh, one of these strategic plans. Uh, was the Clinova project, the Center of Excellence for Digital Health and Personalized Healthcare, where we go a little bit far than simply defining what is uh, uh, what happens in research, where we go really deeply into how will be the healthcare of the future. This is uh, an, a very interesting project, uh, but it shows that we have a strategic view where all these uh, uh, compounds we have before are integrated to, uh, to get to new solution and uh, participate in the paradigm shift we are going to live in the next, uh, in the next uh, years in, in the medical, uh, in the healthcare sector in total. So the other point we wanted to discuss about today was the incubator uh, or accelerator house of biohealth infrastructure. Uh, that was a project uh, that is an, a project that was developed uh, I was the initiator of, and, uh, uh, and uh, together with the Ministry of Economics, we developed the PPP, the Public-Private Partnership, uh, for developing this health tech uh, accelerator. It's today, it's 10,000 square meters of lab space, 300 square meters of startup lab, 6,000 square meters of uh, office, business center, conference room, meeting rooms. Uh, these are the two first phases. Uh, the third phase will be delivered end of this year from the so the, the, the two first phases, 95% are rented, so we have a very good occupational rate, uh, better than most uh, office buildings. We have 450 people on site, more than 100 uh, different uh, na uh, nationalities. We have also 700 access patches, so a lot of people come to the house, not permanently, but are there because the community is on the, on the place. On, the, on, the, on this place. So the community, it's very community oriented. We want to have that, that uh, the, uh, the people who are linked to this sector have a place where they can meet and where they can also develop their activity. This, uh, the House of Biology is 70 million of private investment. PPP with the Ministry of Economics because they are sharing with us some of the of the uh, of the risk uh, of uh, uh, if we don't don't find don't find if we in the beginning we didn't know if we would find enough uh, renters for for this project. So it's a uh, quite um, it was in the beginning it was uh, considered as being a quite um, ambitious project, but now we see that's already too small and we are. We are feeling we have to get even more ambitious to get further, and that we can really play a good role in the, in the future of uh, of healthcare. The House of Bio has also linked, so it's linked in Fit for Start, it's linked in Luik, it's linked in EU Tribe, that are all uh, accelerator uh, associations where we can make our our startups meet. So we, what we do for Fit for Start is that we host these companies for the six first months when they are. Uh, recognized by the by the program, they can have an, an access to House of Bio uh, for free, so they can incorporate their company in our in our infrastructure. This was the part I wanted to present you. We can then come back to this in the roundtable uh, discussion. So if you have any questions, perhaps we can do it later. The floor is now to one of the uh, to one of the uh, of the representatives of the private developed companies in uh, in the sector. So. It's Andreas or Markus, please, the floor is to you. Good afternoon to everybody. My name is Andreas Kramer. I happen to be the co-founder and CEO managing director of ITTM, a young company here in Luxembourg. And actually our offices are within the House of Biohealth and we are really, really happy to be here. Um, just a couple of words to my person in, in the beginning. Um, I received my PhD in genetics from the University of Cologne and uh, worked afterwards some 10 years in various pharma companies and countries in Europe, like J&J in Berze or Siena Biotech in Italy. After that, I worked uh, 
at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, one of the biggest or the biggest university hospital in the Netherlands, mainly there with colleagues in clinical genetics and pathology, which was a combination which got Siemens AG in Vienna interested. And in Vienna, I initiated a systems medicine group. Uh, and with my team, we defined and implemented solutions for electronic health records at that time part of uh, Siemens Healthcare. The common denominator, if you like, of all of this is, um, or through all these activities and uh, you know the locations I worked in, is a drive really to ensure data can be used, is useful, and is actionable, like it's being said here on this slide. Um, making data actionable, as I said, was what we had in mind when we founded ITTM in 2015, as you can see on the on the top left, uh, bottom left, sorry. Um, initially, we started supporting pharma and IMI consortias in respect of the clinical and preclinical data. For the people who don't know, IMI stands for Innovative Medicine Initiative, which is very prestigious in terms of grants because 50% of the money comes from the European Commission and 50% from the FPR from the pharma partners. Um, in the last years, I, I can really proudly say we were really successful gaining reputation and visibility. Um, since 20, approximately 2018, we started the second leg, like we say internally of ITTM, uh, what is called here digital health services with our expertise and experience in data management and data curation. Uh, and also here we start receiving and gaining visibility and reputation and prestigious project, like it's being indicated here at smart for health ICU for COVID, um, which are good projects in, in order to go and, and show what you can do as a young company in uh, cons or in concerted uh, way of working together with big ones, with big companies. Um, what I'm also very proud of, and this is being, being seen here and, and displayed here on the bottom right, so far we, we work in over successfully in over 36 projects. Um, and in terms of uh, Luxembourg organizations uh, receiving EU contributions in terms of grant, ITTM today, or actually in 2020 stands number six. And I think for a young company of our size, this is, this is really positive. And we are definitely driving and striving towards improvement of that. Uh, as you can see over the years, uh, this will be more and more. Now, what is very important also for today's uh, discussion is that out of this digital health services, we started building a minimal viable product called Communication for Care. And here on this slide, I show you a bit more information about that platform module, if you like, which is in the end of the day, a secure and scalable health data as a service platform or module, which is really designed to work seamless in a broader ecosystem. And, you know, you see here on the, in the middle east on T, it is really driven as being not just a, a single a black hole, all data is going in. No, it's being really seen as being interoperable by design and secure by design. So bridging the gaps which are today there. Um, and it's certainly not that we compete just uh, with, with others uh, on features. This is not our gain uh, or aim uh, because we know that many big and small companies are going in the digital market. It's really that we want to ex uh, compete on experience, on the ease of synergies with other products because there's never one product fitting all needs. And uh, we believe and we know that ITTM with the unique combination of what I showed you before in terms of skills and experience, expertise, having the hosting in Luxembourg, which is very important also for not only bank, money, financial data, but also for healthcare data, that this combination is actually a real asset for Luxembourg and uh, for other projects. So our initial focus to be really, you know, also not only, you know, a sky castle, but, but really being on the ground, we focus on Parkinson's disease, a disease in Luxembourg, very important, which not only in Luxembourg is import, uh, important, but worldwide. We uh, have um, understanding together with the Parkinson net in Luxembourg. We agreed to join forces to use the platform I just mentioned, uh, in that context to be the digital platform for Parkinson net and that being uh, and there to be able to show that what we can reach is, is actually not only good for us but also worldwide and as this is being built very generic we can see that uh, and we planned this already that from the MVP in Parkinson uh, much more is being possible uh, at the moment we are seeking investment in, in that area 
uh, and we do have projects uh, running in that as well. So if there's any interest, I'm certainly happy to discuss this in, in, you know, in a follow-up meeting. And with this, obviously, I'm, I'm not doing this alone. This is a team of passionate young people. And with this, I would like to thank for the opportunity to present here a young, interesting company um, with you. And thanks for your attention. And now, stop. Yes, thank you very much. Um... I will now present to you Tolerogenix. Uh, Tolerogenix is also a young startup founded in 2016, which is uh, dedicated to sustainable cure for allergy and developing novel concepts for a world without allergic diseases in collaboration with Luxembourg Institute of Health. And we are also located in the House of Biohealth incubator building that you see here. Um, the key personnel behind Tolerogenix is Jean-Paul Scheuren, who is uh, responsible for business development and financial affairs, together with me as the leading scientist behind the uh, Tolerogenix uh, research. Um, I'm, my passion is allergic diseases, and I'm also a board-certified clinician, scientist, and doctor in dermatology and in allergology, clinical immunology. I joined Luxembourg Institute of Health in 2014 as the director of the Department of Infection and Immunity. And I'm also a professor in clinical allergology at the University of Southern Denmark in Odense in Denmark. Uh, former co-founders who are still working with us are listed uh, in the lower part of the slide, helping us with financial questions and IP uh, property of the company that has been developed together with the Luxembourg Institute of Health. Uh, why are we talking allergic diseases? Allergic diseases are a global health problem with major impact uh, regarding economy and lost working days, missed school days. Alone in Europe, we are counting more than 100 million days uh, a year with huge possible savings if therapeutic options would be improved for patients and people. And we have now recently started a first survey of the situation in Luxembourg that will soon be published together with the Luxembourg Institute of Health. And you can see here that we have 40% sufferers amongst the adult Luxembourgish population uh, having the same impact on economy. And we further have to look at allergy slightly different uh, from previous uh, views. It's the first chronic disease in lifetime affecting children, adolescents, and young adults before the career of chronic inflammatory disease becomes more chronic and leads to other well-known disease of the elderly population. So allergy projected to affect 50% of all Europeans by 2025 is the most common chronic disease in Europe with huge economic impact. 170 million EU citizens suffer from allergic diseases nowadays, and Luxembourg is one of the countries with the highest allergy prevalence in the world, as you can see from these data. So what can Tolerogenics bring now to uh, the table? Tolerogenics has developed, together with the Luxembourg Institute of Health, a unique enabling technology uh, based on a hydrogel, which is able to uh, apply local high concentrations by injection into the human body of active substances that can reinstall a healthy immune response towards an allergen and bring the immune system back to balance again. As you can see here, um, I have told you about the, the co-founders and uh, the people behind Tolerogenics. And I've already told you about the high prevalence of allergic diseases in Europe, this is huge impact uh, on, on, on European uh, uh, econo economic affairs and people's uh, uh, daily lives, as well as also the situation in Luxembourg. Now we look at allergies slightly different as an early disease during early lifetimes, the first chronic inflammatory disease during the lifetime of people, uh, which of course has a huge impact in the European uh, population and worldwide. So we have a huge global problem here, huge global health problem, uh, to which Tolerogenics now wants to uh, bring something to the table. And Tolerogenics has developed, together with the Luxembourg Institute of Health, a unique technology that can allow the application of local high concentration of active substances that can reinstall a healthy immune response towards an allergen and bring everything back to balance. 
Um, the trick is that the allergen and the active substance is injected in a hydrogel, meaning that it is fluid outside the body and forms a gel inside the body once it is injected. And this creates a depot that then leads to a slow release of the active substances. And we have recently shown that in a preclinical model that this works very well. Uh, and this preclinical model is already adapted to the situation of how clinical studies are performed in human beings with all the substances being uh, produced under GMP-like conditions. So the next step is that tolerogenics wants to move forward from the preclinical stage to the clinical stage. And this is based on a strong patent portfolio, a strong and robust preclinical model uh, based on strong research background and data and a strong clinical investigative trial data set that allows to include predictive biomarkers um, that let you predict the success of an immunotherapy already early on, as we have shown in patient studies in other very successful immunotherapies that are already on the market. Furthermore, the technology of uh, Tolerogenics has the ability to be a platform technology that can be out licensed to other partners that want to develop other immunotherapies in the field. Um, and all that will contribute to allergy cure, but also to patient convenience, because currently immunotherapies need to be quite repeatedly injected. And the tolerogenics approach would foresee only a few injections to read. Uh, to reach the full efficiency. So there's a strong business case and a huge impact on society to be expected. So finally, um, this is all I wanted to share with you. Of course, Tolerogenics is a young company that also would like to uh, have investors uh, working with Tolerogenics in the near future towards a world without allergies. Thank you very much. And thanks a lot for the presentation. The same for Andreas and Jean-Paul. Gentlemen, that was quite uh, interesting, straightforward, clear to understand. We are very impressed also by the different curricula uh, of uh, your career and also your studies. So that's really great and helps really to understand in which sector you're working. So you will certainly appear again at the end of our panel in order to discuss some interesting trends of the future. And now we will then pass over to the VC and investors perspective. And that's why I would like to welcome then Nico van der Welpen from Biocube Ventures, Vincent Brichard from Vianova Biosciences, Agnieszka Noel Druge from Vianova Venture Partner, and also Daniele Cardoso from 3E. So, first of all, welcome. And um, it would be great if you could introduce yourselves quickly, also explain us, um, give us some hints about your studies and certainly also your professional track record. Well, thank you. <clears throat> well, my name is Nico van der Velpen. I'm uh, an economist by training, and I'm now a little over 20 years active in uh, the space, the interesting space of, of venture capital, and more specific in biotech. I kicked off my career as an advisor, as a consultant on the M&A side, and now for the last 15 years, I'm, um, I'm in venture capital, being a venture capitalist, first with a regional investment fund in Belgium, and then since officially since uh, mid last year, uh, we founded Biocube Factory Fund One, which is soon to be a um, plus 100 million euro fund investing in um, therapeutics, so therapeutic development, new therapeutic developments, who are, uh, let's say, in a late preclinical and early clinical stage. So we invest uh, the majority uh, of our funds into uh, Europe and to a less extent into uh, the US. Um, why Europe? Because we feel that in Europe there is a lot of activity. Europe is really um, moving into the right direction for, already for years, but for sure over the last years and is, um, is uh, for us the, a, a very interesting hotspot and emerging area to invest in. Thank you, Nico. What about you, Vincent and Agnieszka? Um, thank you. My name is uh, Vincent Richard. Very pleased to be here with this uh, panel um, tonight. Uh, I'm an, a physician by training, uh, specialized in uh, oncology, uh, work both at the Institut Curie in Paris and Brussels University. Also, I have an executive MBA from the Harvard Business School. Um, I did a lot of research in uh, tumor immunology and spent about uh, 15 years in uh, industry, namely uh, GSK where I led a business unit encompassing discovery to um, 
uh, Central Commercial Organization. Left uh, GSK in 2015, and since then, I'm uh, working uh, a lot with the uh, European uh, bioclusters, uh, not only in Belgium, but covering uh, basically the entire Western Europe and facilitating the link between the founders that have an ID, sometimes very creative, and the, uh, um, the investors uh, that are uh, much uh, straightforward in their mind, I would say, uh, and with um, a bunch of uh, other folks that all have a biotech of industrial background, we try to um, uh, converge with a financial return, which is mandatory and also a societal impact, uh, especially in the bioclusters in Belgium, mimicking what has been done in the US about 20 years ago. My name is Agnieszka Noedrus. I'm very pleased to participate in this panel as well. Um, I'm graduated in marketing and management, but I spent my main part of the career in financial sector based in Luxembourg. I'm collaborating with Vianova Ventures and bridging Luxembourg with, uh, with the, the rest of this Europe and uh, Vianova's dynamics for the developments and investments. Uh, I have also some seats as an independent director in the companies. I'm also executive director in a French independent pharmaceutical company. Uh, and since the past two years, I'm discovering and I'm learning a lot about uh, European pharma development, European healthcare industry as such. And I'm very happy to assist some entrepreneurs who need to, uh, to find an investment, but also to bridge some countries that I can connect with uh, those investors like European uh, countries in like Poland and so on. So the, uh, yeah, I'm very happy to share my experience. Thank you, Vincent and Agnieszka. And uh, Daniele, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. And thank you for inviting me to this very interesting panel. Uh, my name is Daniele Cardoso and uh, I'm 59. I've been in the industry, in the farm and biotech industry for roughly 35 years with different roles. First of all, as an industrialist, uh, being uh, um, involved in the production of active pharmaceutical ingredients. Therefore, I was uh, supplying and, and partnering with the pharma and biotech company as the uh, producer of the active ingredients. Then as investor, once I sold my company uh, in Italy, I moved to Luxembourg where I have my family office, Brazil. And as an investor, I've been investing in publicly listed companies, in uh, private equity funds, as well as venture or direct investment, being uh, uh, slightly experienced in, in, this, in this field. And last but not least, I uh, have created a small advisory boutique in Switzerland where I had my part of my team based. And therefore, I'm continuing to participate in this fascinating world as an advisor. So I played three different roles as a player in the industry, as an investor still today, and as an advisor still today. Thanks for these very pragmatic presentations. So if you allow me now, let me ask you that general and genuine question to all of you, why biotech and since when? You highlighted a few elements, but I think your audience is quite interested by how the entire story started. Uh, why biotech? Because simply uh, it's a constant learning curve. This is where innovation lies. And this is also a field where you can associate um, probably some um, exciting financial returns or multiple. And also you can go, you can do the best for mankind uh, an example in my uh, own personal life, I spent 15 years at uh, GSK Vaccines, where we were producing vaccines for developed countries with a pretty high price, but also for emerging countries, where actually our pride, for instance, for the malaria vaccine, we knew from the start we would not make that much of the money, but we would contribute to the education of the children in Africa and South America, and that was the other face um, of the business that could allow us to uh, stand in front of the mirror and, and pass the red face test. So biotechnology is um, probably uh, something where you can constantly improve, you can constantly create, uh, and also uh, do the good for the mankind and for your investors. That's all for me. Thanks. Um, and adding a note to what Vincent just saying, of course, um, being on the venture capital side, obviously the first reaction is return, financial return. But uh, 
I think that the most important thing on biotech uh, is, is of course the impact that you have on society. Uh, and uh, um, if you, uh, we all are in the middle of still this crisis, this COVID crisis, and I'm pretty sure that we now um, more than ever are aware of the impact that one can make or what, what health has on our lives, on our daily lives, uh, what good health has on our daily lives. And uh, I think that by linking the two together, the science, the, 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 the technology, the innovation that is constantly on the table and is constantly evolving, that this sector is more than ever uh, a sector to, to take into consideration. And, and from an investor's perspective, that you see that there is a lot, a lot of attention and a lot of money more than ever available now to invest in, in, in innovation and in, 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 in healthcare in general. Uh, that's at least my experience, what I, what I feel on a daily basis, that is that the amount of money available for this sector is, is, is huge and for the better, uh, not, for, not only for the returns, but for the better. Those are also certainly great values to also have an impact. And you, you mentioned the different multiples also. Um, if uh, nobody wants to add anything to how the biotech adventure started for you, we could move on then to the next question. For example, you, you mentioned the multiples. What differentiates then the biotech investment opportunity compared to other sectors or strategies? If you want, I can say something. I mean, certainly, uh, other than the impact, as was mentioned before, uh, that makes a difference. There's, there's no doubt about it. You have a very high risk, but a very high return. Therefore, if you look at into uh, from an investment perspective, it is certainly uh, a combination of, of values and, and financial uh, return that you can that you can achieve, and uh, also the fact that through through Fagma you can uh, certainly also contribute to the progress of, of the industry overall so it's a very long value chain and therefore this has also an impact over on the economy so uh, not only because of covid but we have heard how crucial is the pharmaceutical industry in the economy of, of our countries that is, that is exactly that is exactly true daniele and um, uh, Perhaps making it a little bit more concrete in terms of, of value and multiples and also in, in, in better understanding the life cycle um, of, of, of biotech investments, if I may add a couple of words. So we did some, some research uh, in preparation of this webinar. And if I see the evolution over the last five years um, on the M&A side in biotech, yeah, then in 2015, the Average upfront values that were paid for M&A deals were around 200 million US dollars, with a total deal value averaging um, half a billion. If I look into this for last year, the upfronts were 300 million dollars, with an average deal value, a total deal value uh, close to 800 million dollars. And uh, what is interesting to see is that uh, we usually talk about um, long. Um, let's say long holding periods of, of uh, companies uh, in, in the biotech. Well, the years to exit after first investments, they decrease to four average on those deal values. So that, put, that puts it a little bit in perspective, if I may say so, uh, not only from the obviously the, the impact on mankind and so on, but if you look into the life cycle of, of biotech, how that has evolved over the, the years. Eh? Whereas in 2016, the years to exit were six years. Today, in 2020, the years to exit were four years. So if you compare those, and if you, uh, if you transpose them on the current situation in biotech and what is now going on eh, with the, the awareness around health and, and the, the rapid developments that we've all experienced over the, the last year, uh, the year and a half. Uh, I think that the sector as a whole has moved into a new dimension and into a new perspective. Yeah. And I think that's something that is, is, is worthwhile keeping in mind that um, uh, on average, the life cycle of, of course, bringing a product to the market is still long. Huh? That is, that's for sure. But from an investor's perspective, your turnaround is much shorter than it, it used to be in the past. Thank you, Dico. You mentioned the life cycle. 
Uh, any additional details you would like to also share on, on the deal flow, the complete investment cycle? Do you have some concrete examples you would like to, to yeah. underline? Well, uh, what I can state is, first of all, on the deal flow. Eh? Uh, the deal flow, we as an, invest as an investor, we still receive on average one, one to two opportunities on a daily basis. Eh? Uh, people fi finding you um, through either through different fora that are organized or people knowing each other and, and sending through opportunities and so on. So, and that's, I'm only talking about European uh, opportunities then. Eh? And, and we, uh, we are still, uh, as, as a young fund, we are still, obviously we are veterans in the sector, but we are still putting ourselves on the map. And, and, and that is already in terms of deal flow, what we see on an annual, on a daily basis. Now, um, that in terms of, of, of deal flow. Now, in terms of types of deals, eh, uh, what we've witnessed over the last years, that is that we've seen an enormous shift from uh, opportunities who um, used to be in a later stage of development, uh, being phase two, phase three, to a much earlier stage of development, being late preclinical phase one, where there is a lot of uh, activity, right, which always was, but there is now much more activity. And you see that there is much more invested in those, let's say, more earlier type of investment opportunities, meaning that there is obviously uh, much more money available, as I already said, but also that the focus of the investors moved much more into that earlier space. And what is there the reason behind that is that pharma also moved into that direction over the last five plus years. Uh, and that obviously then relates to the fact that pharma is much more focused on external innovation and external R&D instead of doing that work themselves. And if you then put all what I've just said all together in one bucket, uh, the summary of that is, is that um, the focus is much earlier. The exits are also much more focused on that air, in that space. The amount of money invested in those early, in that earlier space being late preclinical and phase one, phase two is much higher than it has ever been before. And that due to the change uh, in mindset and also the change of focus of pharma uh, towards our sector. Yeah. I think that that for me is, is what, what I've witnessed, what I see and what, what happened over the last five years. Uh, and also, if, if you want, I can demonstrate that with deal values and so on, but I think that goes too far. Uh, but it, it's in, 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 that's a key change. Thank you, Nico. Great summary of uh, what's currently happening. Certainly also the early stage. Yeah, I can, I can confirm what, what Nico was saying in the sense that as an LP, I'm seeing that the speed by which the, 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 the funds where, where I'm investing or where I'm requested to invest are moving much faster than before. Uh, and, and therefore the fundraising and the, and the capital uh, are deployed much faster. And this is a consequence of what Nico was saying. I have to, to add that this, in a way, is increasing the risk of the investment itself, because the earlier you go, uh, the more danger uh, you, you run, because obviously the, the drugs or the projects are, are at a very, very early stage. And what has also to be uh, considered in, in the risk profiling of the investment is the fact that this is a very highly regulated industry. So if you are very good in developing a product, does not mean that you can go uh, to the market at the same pace as in other industry, because all is related to the regulators that have to review your dossier. So as an investor, you have to be aware that it's very attractive, can give very a lot of, of satisfaction and returns, but also the risk is not only related to the product, but is also related to the timing that um, are linked to the review of the regulator. Only what we see today that because of the COVID, a lot of clinical trials have been delayed because of the emergency of the COVID. So someone who was invested in, in, in uh, companies or projects that had to be delayed because of COVID were in the right place, but not with the right product. So this has also to be very much underlined in my opinion. If I may add some considerations that uh will not be totally divergent, but uh, might uh, might uh, open the discussion actually um, to, to the panel. 
So it is true that um, why to the question why biotechnology for an investor, if you look at the Cambridge Associate over the last five years, healthcare in terms of return has been in the top three uh, versus the uh, other sectors, including all the private equity segments that you can imagine. Regarding the cycle, biotechnology is still a very long cycle. Uh, the cycle or the time to exit has moved because simply uh, the pharma put billions in R&D and were lacking productivity, showing the inertia of the pharma. And uh, this model uh, has changed dramatically the European landscape where actually the money is now um, coming more into universities and early pharma collaboration with academic groups. And this is new. And this is a change over the last two decades in Europe that we have witnessed. Uh, and when I was referring to the US, 20 years ago, the US universities had no shame in making money out of the research and the innovation from the academia. I remember that when I left university in, uh, in the 2002, uh, one of my best friends at university told me that I was selling my soul to the devil because I was joining the pharmaceutical industry. Just, just to exemplify the mindset of Europe 20 years back. Today, all universities do have their technology platform. They try to patent, to value their patents, and there is no shame in making money or making license deal. Uh, and, and researchers get um, a reward, financial reward from their uh, innovation. So that's uh, something that has changed a lot uh, in the European landscape. No, if you compare, I'm still in the US European comparison. If you compare the number of patents that is a reflect of the innovation in Europe and the US, that number is pretty similar, uh, very similar. If you're looking at the money injected in the biotechnology um, sector, the money in Europe in biotech is 10 times lower than the amount injected in the uh, US biotechnology sector. So this reflects actually a lack of financing. And what we see is a very heterogeneous landscape in terms of investment fund in Europe. If you take Belgium close to Luxembourg, you have a multiplicity of small funds, small in size, not in quality, huh? get me right. Uh, very high quality of the funds, but still, uh, not funds of uh, 800 million or 1 billion. If you look at the Netherlands, where there is not that many bio clusters that are robust, not that many uh, companies that are created, you have three major funds that are dominating the European landscape. And what you observe is that the bigger, the better for those funds that are getting into more mature opportunity, phase two, phase three, and that are shying away from the early opportunities whilst the multiple in early opportunities are much higher, times 12, but you need really the skills, the added value, you need to be close to the uh, investment because biotechnology is not just about investing money, it is about being sophisticated, educated, and understanding, especially in early stage, uh, what it is all about, elaborating the business plan and mapping actually the time to exit or mapping the landing zone of your company. And this is why in Europe, there is um, an issue popping up, is that there is less funds dedicated to the seed uh, round. And I'm happy that Nico is here with BioCube because this is one of their obsession in there. If I see the big fund in Europe, they try to get more mature opportunity. Another trend we see is China, Korea, and US funds that are coming in Europe, that are uh, coming with a lot of money, and so getting into more mature opportunities because they do not have the insider network to get into universities and that are taking much less care about the valuation. European research was uh, reputed as being cheap. No uh, a company compared to five years ago is probably valued times or three times higher than it used to be because of this competition and the uh, Emirates or Chinese or Korean or US funds coming into more mature opportunity. So this is a turning point, I think, uh, in Europe is to take care about the seed because this is where really the innovation lies. This is where the uh, largest return can be done from a financial perspective. And this is probably it can be or the society can be the most impactful in terms of 
getting the employment and also the intellectual property. So some changes in the landscape of, of Europe is, is moving a little bit uh, for the best, I think. Yeah, perhaps adding a couple of words to that, Vincent. So um, I agree with the number of funds, uh, but what, what we witnessed over the last two, three years, uh, and I'm sure that you're with me on that one, is, is that there are quite a number of new players in the field uh, in, in Europe. So the number of players in the biotech venture capital community is increasing and the funds are getting bigger and bigger. And the scope of those funds, um, like the more, let's say, the more established ones in, in the Netherlands, for instance, they have this dual investment model eh, where on the one hand, they look into growth opportunities and on the other hand, they have the, the, the focus also on earlier stage. So uh, that of course, from a portfolio strategy helps in terms of risk mitigation. On the other hand, if you look into the number, of, uh, in, in, if you look into the, the, the rounds, the rounds, the early CDA rounds, if you compare the, the height of the investments. Eh? So like Serie A rounds of 20 plus million euro are today more common than ever before in Europe, even also in Europe. Eh? Um, and that is new. That is something that for the last two, two, two three years has become very important, uh, important new shift. Whereas uh, five years ago, the first Series A round, even seed rounds, were very small pocket money invested in companies and then usually with investors who did not have, um, let's say, enough um, dry powder to bring those companies to value inflection points. Today, that is completely different, if you ask me. Now, today, you see much more uh, money invested in earlier Series A, Series B rounds, which bring the companies much more to maturation points, which is good, eh? which definitely helps to bring companies further down the road with, let's say, the less worry on uh, constant fundraising mode, because constant fundraising mode has an impact on the quality of the company and the quality of the management for sure. Eh? So that is a new, let's say, wind. And that is more in compared to what we see of what we've seen in the US in the last 10 years plus even. Eh? So that ties out to what you said, uh, Versailles, compared doing the comparison with the US and Europe. Uh, what is still the case, and I think that is also one of the attractions that Europe still has, that is that still today, the companies in the EU are valued maybe three times lower for the same, let's say, stage of the company compared to the US. And that obviously has to do with the fact that there is much more money available in the US, bigger funds, competition is much higher, huh? Hence, the valuations goes up. Plus, another important point, uh, the mentality in the US is somewhat different than in the EU, still somewhat different. If a US entrepreneur fails, that's like a war mark, but it's locked like a stamp for life. It's like, okay, we failed, over to the next one. And that's a completely different mentality. Also from the academic side, if a professor, if he fails in a certain, let's say, uh, research program, that does not mean the end. It basically is the start of a new beginning. Eh? And, and that is also, if you ask me, that mentality shift is now also coming towards Europe. We are not yet there, but for sure it will help in the further development of this cluster of this biotech sector in general. Eh? So and I think that's also something which is worthwhile mentioning. Hence, we see that a lot of US funds are now looking to Europe uh, and into the European scene because there is less competition, valuations are lower. So the upsides are, of course, much higher for them. You know? So yeah, that's my, my, my view on, on the last, uh, let's say, uh, 24, 36 months. I, I just want to say that I fully agree with, with what Nico was saying. I mean, the concept of failure in Europe is still considered a shame, especially in the South Belt, uh, the Sun Belt of Europe. I would like to add also something else. I mean, that United States is basically one jurisdiction in Europe. We have many jurisdictions. So if venture capital needs to have a friendly environment from a jurisdiction standpoint. This is not Europe where you have 27 different jurisdictions. 
So if you have a, a project with multi-state where you have a CDMO that is based in, uh, in France, the, the lab, the R&D lab in, in the Netherlands, and, uh, and the review of the CRO is in Germany, you have true jurisdiction, while in the state this is not the case. So this is making life more complicated for investors as well. If I may answer, it's also the culture. In Europe, we don't have a culture, investment cultures. Still, this is something is coming to Europe, as you say, but it's still not a culture from the whole industry, financial industry. There is no support yet. And there is no the spirit of European investment. So the, there is also some kind of education and culture that we should give uh, to the venture capital and private equity in this kind of risky investments, because uh, we think national, we think we borders, and we need to act together. Because as you mentioned, there is many opportunities Europe in Europe. There are many companies. We have a lot of patents here in Europe, and we need to think borderless. This is something that we need to have also this culture from financial industry. Coming from this industry, I can see that uh, due to this lack of uh, uh, regulations, many countries, many regulations, lot of restrictions because the private equity is very restrictive uh, industry. You have to comply with regulation, with all rules and so on. So there is also this lack of interest coming from banks, asset managers that you will find in the United States. You will have the support coming from financial industry, strong. There is no such support yet in Europe. Although we, we cannot neglect the important role that, for instance, the European Investment Fund is playing in helping all uh, venture funds in Europe or throughout Europe. Eh? So if you look into what the European Investment Fund is doing uh, and more than ever, uh, the amount of money that they are deploying in our sector is huge, is really huge. And if you look, uh, what is also good to know is, is that the best returns they are making, they are making out of investments in biotech venture funds, obviously in Europe. So lots of promising changes, but also challenges, and so which keep, will keep you certainly uh, quite uh, active in the future. Um, we also heard high risks and then high returns. Um, what would be, from your perspective, the optimal risk and return ratio one investor could expect from your sector? Sky's the limit, but you have to be aware that you are exposed to major risk. So the, the, there's nothing more to add, I would say. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm trying to build on what you say, uh, Daniele. Um, I, I think that there are two or three considerations. The first one is that, as in any investment, there should be absolutely no emotion. So uh, sometimes you see deals where there is a lot of competition, emotion, people are putting letter of intent on the table and you don't want to miss the opportunity, but then it's probably a wrong move. So only rational and absolutely no emotion. The second one is that um, every fund has, uh, has a process which is named the due diligence, where you take uh, a few weeks to go into the science, into the financial. And the question should be less about, uh, is it a risky business? Uh, well, it is for sure a risky business, like uh, probably a, a lot of other uh, businesses. Uh, it is all about identifying the risk and uh, mapping uh, how you can manage the risk. So all is about risk management and, and, and experience, I would say, so that you can see the blind spot of the company, you can see the pitfalls, and you can manage to go through the pitfalls. I have not seen myself any biotechnology projects that was doing or executed according to plans. There is always something going wrong, uh, and there is you unfrequently good surprises, more frequently bad surprises. So you need actually to reflect a lot before you invest. You need to be fully educated, not only yourself, but uh, uh, being at the heart of a network of people that will uh, get their brain close to your brain so that you can uh, uh, actually sell your house to put the money into that very project. And very often when I'm asking external experts uh, their opinion or their view, most of them are coming from universities or, um, or, or not uh, really uh, the banking side or financing side. And this is a question I'm, I'm asking them. Would you sell your own house to put the money into this project that we're asking you to give an opinion? 
uh, and um, and this is more probably the way you can manage the risk you can map the risk and then you you take it uh, one thing that is emerging for some funds because all are claiming this is uh, to be close to the investment meaning being on the shop floor helping the company because we do not have in europe we see that emerging but we do not have uh, unlike the us a lot of serial entrepreneurs so people that have exited their company that have gone through successes uh, and that know actually uh, what are the except the hiccups of of the life in biotechnology so the investment funds that have seen a lot of biotechnology going wrong, going right, need to be very close, uh, not only give money or the uh, address book, but uh, advise the uh, management, um, support the management to be successful in these um, very early days that are extremely pivotal um, for the early companies. I fully agree with you. I mean, this is a, this is a science-based industry so you cannot ignore i mean it's not a matter of asset allocation that because today healthcare is is on under the spot because of covid then it's good to to invest in in, in pharma and in biotech so i fully agree i fully agree with the fact that you have to be very disciplined and that you have to go no matter whether it is a big ticket or, or a small ticket as well as to be hands-on and possibly to have a fund that is managed also with operating partners because again, if you don't have a scientist that is really involved in the daily operation of the different companies' portfolio, and it's, pure it's a pure financial team that eventually uh, hire a consultant, but it's not on a daily basis, so it's not their own uh, daily activity. I don't think it's a good it's a good criteria. So in general, investors have to be disciplined, so not by benchmark or by these kind of things. And this is difficult because sometimes it's time consuming. But I think that especially in a very complicated uh, industry like this one, it's absolutely essential. And this is what I try to follow personally. Hmm. Absolutely. So I think that if you look into the, the, the setup of the teams of a venture fund in this sector, eh? Um, I can tell you, I'm the only economist in the group. Right? All the rest is scientifically trained and has either an entrepreneurial background or a big pharma background or uh, being pure academic, deep science. And we, as a team, we, we claim that we do not know everything because this sector is extremely difficult. Eh? So following the trends is already one thing but knowing this the deep science on all aspects is, is extremely difficult so you constantly need to surround yourselves with experts in all fields eh? and and make make use of them uh, as part of your decision criteria and your portfolio management and strategy is extremely important to constantly challenge every deal that you do uh, against your strategy eh? And um, I think th another point which was raised by Versailles is, is proximity. Proximity does matter. I'm completely with you in terms of working together with the teams, with the entrepreneurs. And um, uh, one of the important things, what we, we, what we always say is, is that um, you, need to, you, you need to have the experience in the group of people who went through big failures. Because out of the biggest failures, you learn the most, of course. Eh? And uh, if, if, if you can transpose that kind of experience to the companies with whom you are working and in whom you have invested, that's the most important thing, I would say. Being on a, on a board of directors, being a director in a company is the easiest part. Being a, a, couch, a coach, being a listening ear, being and helping hand for the entrepreneurs on the other side, that's the most difficult part. And their proximity does matter. Um, I'm 100% aligned uh, on that one, absolutely. Thanks for this additional insights and also for your transparency. Um, we heard before also lots of comparisons between Europe and the US. Actually, where are the international other biotech hotspots? And if we now take the biotech investments and the biotech funds raising activities, would that also change the overall global picture? And finally, we heard Luxembourg, Belgium, what about the Benelux region? It's also the beauty of Luxembourg. We are in the middle of a very interesting uh, 
biotech uh, clusters because we have Germany, we have France, we have, of course, Netherlands. A little bit uh, we, we far, a little bit uh, further, we go to Switzerland. So it's very close to Luxembourg. And this is also why it makes uh, this European center very interesting because everything is close. So th this makes also the possibilities of bridging and collaboration. Uh, we had such a chance with Vincent to discuss some Belgian product, uh, projects with Luxembourgish uh, experts from Luxembourg Institute of, of Health and so on. So there is many possibilities because of this proximity. So there is definitely Benelux, but also France, Germany, Switzerland. So those centers are very close and they should collaborate. Yeah. If, if, if I may follow, um, well, th this is a moving target. Huh? Uh, 20 years back, if we had to map the bio clusters in Europe, uh, I mean, we could use only a single hand and probably three fingers. Um, in Europe, the luck and the bad luck is that uh, it is not centralized. We started in a region, that's right, um, Benelux. Um, in, in Belgium, if I want to be a little bit closer and to zoom, it started mostly in Flanders huh, 20, 20 years back. And then the southern of Belgium realized that biotechnology was, uh, well, uh, A, a profitable business, and B, was a, 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 as a huge societal impact. And if I take um, the, um, that example of Wallonia, uh, actually, there was a lot of public funding that was uh, given to cities to recycle the jobs uh, because of the steel industry that was failing down. And today, the money uh, of that steel industry, 50 to 60% of the subsidies are focusing on biotechnology that is giving back actually 80% of the profits of those uh, cities. Uh, so uh, if you are talking about um, the clusters, I think that's where you have a proximity of academic network, where you have proximity of educated investors, where you have um, the proximity of other clusters, uh, such as Benelux, Germany, Switzerland, east of France or France. Um, maybe um, uh, Luxembourg could be a nice uh, area to set up actually an incubator or a new cluster uh, lagging behind. But uh, the example I chose in Belgium uh, exemplify very well that you can lag 20 years behind another cluster and still be successful or get into a, uh, another um, another um, field uh, of therapeutics. Um, that um, region I, I was referring to, the southern part of Belgium, focused most on um, uh, CDMO or CMO activities, so service activities rather than developing uh, projects from universities. And that's a different topic than the VIV at the time of Flanders. Uh, and, and still it is successful with uh, a success uh, of the exit of Master Cell, huh? sold to Catalan or Novacep, uh, more recently sold to Thermo Fisher or Mitra. So this is a different business. Uh, so there is certainly a place for a new business, a new innovation center, uh, as long as um, people can uh, mix uh, uh, the, uh, the brains from academia, from the network and the financing uh, with no real pressure, but education in the in the finance. Uh, if you look into um, Europe and compare it to the US, let's be honest, and Daniel already alluded to the fact that the US is one country okay, with a lot of clusters uh, going from Boston over uh, San Francisco, San Diego, right, they're, they're all over the place. Uh, uh, if you would put that map over Europe and you would consider Europe as one country, then obviously we have also a lot of clusters, part of the European Union eh, with more activity in certain areas. Let's not forget, although the UK is no longer part of Europe, but the UK is still a very important contributor in our sector eh, with a lot of activity in, in the field. Eh. But if you look then into the Benelux, Switzerland, what's going on in, in, in those regions um, and compare that with, with the US uh, as a global, as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a whole, as one region, huh? um, then I would say not in terms of individual, uh, let's say companies or, or successes, but in terms of clustering everything together, we are not in bad shape. Huh? Um, is there still room for further, uh, let's say, hubs, biotech hubs, 
there will always be room for biotech hubs, but it needs to be linked to um, the brain power, which is in short distance and not linked to political reasons to set up a cluster. Uh, and I think that is important because it's still um, there are clusters created in regions where there is hardly any uh, academic or any, let's say, network available but still we are spending a lot of money and I'm not sure that that is money right spent. Eh? And that's an open question. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I'm extremely in favor of, of uh, grouping uh, clusters together and, and building bridges between clusters because let's be honest, uh, somebody who needs to fly from Boston to San Francisco <laughs> takes longer than flying from Barcelona to Luxembourg. Eh? So. Um, what's what's in the name eh? and what's in the name of the region then so uh, I would I would all I would put it a little bit in perspective eh? uh, but then let's not forget okay we are maybe Europe is still lacking a little or running behind on the US on the other hand in terms of of network we're not in bad shape eh? united we are certainly stronger Thanks again also for this uh, specific strategic analysis. And uh, now we'll invite back Jean-Paul and also Andreas and Marcus to join us for the last question. So the audience, now is the time. If you have still some questions open concerning the biotech investment opportunity, please use the chat or Q&A. So in a very concise manner, what would you um, underline and describe as the current hottest trends in your favorite sector, so the biotech sector? and how could the future of biotech look like very soon? I see some mega trends in the healthcare sector. Uh, I would say it's PPP. It's pre preventive, predictive, and personalized medicine. Uh, and uh, also data-based uh, medicine. So I see a lot of things that we go in a paradigm shift for healthcare. And I see that a country like Luxembourg could really uh, play a big role in uh, uh, with, with the science it has, uh, the high level science it has developed. So I see that uh, these mega trends are going to really change a lot what is happening in this sector. On this, I will maybe add also the need of collaboration. And uh, this is also something that we. Uh, experience with COVID uh, period, there is a real need of, of collaboration between European countries. And here again, uh, small uh, countries like Luxembourg, Luxembourg could be also used as a test country for some collaboration in some areas of biotech development. But we should have more investment, higher collaboration, and be more fast on decisions. Um, may I add that what, what we actually are seeing now in the, in the research field, in biomedical research, that we are using much more patient-based data. So we do the deep molecular profiling of patient uh, studies. Um, and this actually adds a lot uh, to what we have been doing in the past, where we more or less only use the molecular pathways from the cell culture or the animal experiments to get some informed information, the rationale for an approach. But nowadays we are actually much quicker in the patient setting and can do some really highly informative studies uh, using deep profiling of patients. And this already gives us a lot of more insight into the situation of a certain disease that actually can also help to reduce risks uh, to a certain extent in the future, because this is certainly a new paradigm. Yeah, and lately, maybe also from my side, picking up on the word of collaboration, you know, in my case, it would be interoperability across borders. You know, all this data is not just, you know, within one country and Benelux or Luxembourg being in the center of Europe can also be the central hub for Europe in a way to have secure data. And, uh, you know, I keep saying Luxembourg showed to do this in the financial world. I don't see a reason why this kind of data could not also, or this kind of paradigm could not also be in healthcare data to be a safe hub, a safe haven, basically for personal, for secure and, and really, you know, good data in, in Europe. What I see is certainly the convergence between the, the technology and the, and the biotech industry. I mean, now we, we also have seen how fast was the development of the vaccine for COVID thanks not only to the funding, but to deployment of the best technology. And I believe that the more this will be 
uh, common to use uh, in artificial, artificial intelligence, for example, in the, in the design of the experiment or in the data that are used to uh, develop uh, new molecules or, nucle or elaborate new clinical data, I think that this will certainly be a trend. So therefore, also combining biotech with medtech and, and help the clinical trials to be faster and more effective through the, uh, through the data management, I believe this will certainly offer new opportunities uh, as investors, but also as founder of, of company. Yeah. Uh, if, if I may add some reflections. So when, when we are talking about hotspot, we could um, reflect on uh, what are the best innovations in oncology, autoimmunity, and so on. But um, I would like to go beyond what we see now is actually the convergence of every serial some avenues. Um, we usually, usually divided the medtech industry, the diagnostic industry, and the therapeutic industry. And more and more, we see uh, companies that are mixing up these technologies to get the best out of it. And they, with new names, Terranostic, so a diagnostic to improve the decision to apply a treatment with better efficacy or less uh, toxicity. So that's one trend where uh, I think Europe is not lagging behind other uh, regions in the world. Um, the um, second one is, I mentioned the serial entrepreneurs. So having those people that have built, have incorporated a company that live with it days and nights for five years, that exited it, and then they don't stop. They don't buy an island in the Caribbean, but they are just, they have an appetite. They are entrepreneurs and they do it a second time, a third time, a fourth time. And we see that generation popping up uh, in Europe. So we should benefit from this trend. Third consideration is, uh, you mentioned, Daniele, the COVID. What's, what was striking to me coming from GSK is that the big vaccine manufacturers, so Merck in US, GSK, Sanofi, that are probably uh, getting 90% of the vaccine produced and sold in the world, they totally missed the COVID. And where did the vaccine came from? Moderna and BioNTech. So small companies, very agile, very flexible, that they've been trying cancer vaccines for years that failed and they took an opportunity, they mobilized forces in a couple of months and they did it. So that's uh, also something that, that we see is that innovation is just going from where you, you don't see it emerging. And then they got uh, association with, with the giants that do not want to, uh, to lose the, uh, the key. The final reflection on my side is the inability so the lack uh, of Europe to retain research and to retain those industries. We see too often industry for financing reasons that are going into the US is still dreamland huh, for many of those because it is the market. This is where you will sell your product at the highest price or no, more and more, they go uh, to the East, they go to Asia, traditionally Japan, but emerging Korea and China. And not only when they are desperate, not only when they can't find uh, institutional investors in Europe or coming from the US and when you try to get uh, cheap and quick and easy money, money in Asia uh, is not that uh, quick and cheap and easy. But more and more, there is a, a trend to value actually the assets, not only in North America, but also in Asia, uh, where you can get a, a big chunk of, of return uh, over there. So these are the four considerations I would have um, to, to end with. Uh, the first one being the mix of those different sectors. Second one is the generation of serial entrepreneurs. The third one is innovation coming from small, very agile uh, entrepreneurial company. And uh, sorry to be a little bit uh, negative there, it is improving, but Europe is lacking uh, or is missing actually the ability to retain research and maybe the COVID has opened some avenues and some uh, new considerations that it was important to control actually you healthcare generation. So yes. you're endorsing um, the importance of biotech uh, for sure. <laughs> and especially what is going on uh, in Europe. Uh, and, and one of the most important points was made on, on what you said about BioNTech and Moderna. Uh, so I think that that really is an eye opener for our sector that companies who were active in a certain field 
that changing their 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 mindset or changing their their or using their innovation into another direction and bringing something at lightning speed to the market or at least uh, under the uh, to in in the in the in the heat i would say that is that is biotech eh? that is what biotech should stand for and that is what innovation should stand for and let's hope that we see that we've learned lessons out of that and that for sure the regulators learned lessons out of that as well and let's not forget getting a product through the regulations in the us versus europe it is different <laughs> so great lessons to retain also a little bit like uh, you highlighted the talents that we should attract back to europe or at least try with the right incentives to retain i think this was really a very strong and robust webinar thanks to you dear panelists it was really wonderful to have all those different uh, actors, practitioners, and passionate experts around the table. Also, thanks to you, the audience, for attending our specialized and sophisticated uh, webinars too. And uh, we'll hope to see you very soon again. Thanks a lot for joining and see you soon.